Okay, let's kick off. This session is unleashing the, unleashing the power of AI and smart cloud uh, storage. I have lots of people to introduce, but I'm going to let Mike Welts do all that for me. So, introducing Mike. Thank you for uh, just saying what the session is. We won the award for the longest title for a session <laughs> of the day, clearly. I don't even remember what the session is called anymore at this point. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Welts. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for a company called Wasabi Technologies. Um, thrilled to be here today with you folks. We're going to talk all kinds of things about storage, but ultimately about AI as well, the impact of AI on storage. My guests here, Archana Vekatrama. How'd I do? Yes. All right, very yes, good. I oh, nice. Yes. Wow, <laughs> very nice. She's a research director with IDC. Also, uh, we have Matthew Quinn, or Matt Quinn. Uh, he's VP of Technology at Liverpool. Any Liverpool fans in the house? <laughs> Some of you want to admit that. Some others are like, you're brave people. Thank you very much. And we have John Howes, who runs uh, Wasabi uh, for EMEA for us. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, so here we are, 30 years into object storage, 30 years or 25 years into the cloud now, and finally the world is starting to lift off. There's finally a movement to the cloud for a lot of different reasons, but I'm gonna ask the expert to kind of walk you through the numbers behind this market, because clearly the movement's on. So. 700% growth just over the last six years. What's driving that? Yeah, I mean, if, if there's one constant in the industry, it's the data growth, right? Velocity, volume, um, variety, so it's just data growth. But what, what's fascinating is the continuous growth and overwhelming growth of unstructured data. And for a lot of organizations, it was, it was important, but now suddenly they realize the potential of extracting value from that unstructured data, and that's what's driving a lot of interest and making it a lot more strategic as well. Let's see, let's show them one more statistical kind of slide here. 93% of all data is now unstructured. What this panel is about is giving value or giving meaning to that data. Exactly. That's where the growth is, right, going forward. So let's, um, let's talk about perhaps what the inhibitors were to cloud cloud adoption, if you will, from a storage standpoint. Yeah. Started out with things like price, but talk a little yeah, bit more yeah. about that. Yeah, so when initially when organizations started looking at cloud storage. Pardon, pardon the Can everybody hear her? Can okay. you hear me okay? All right, great, yeah, thank you. Perfect. So um, when organizations started looking at um, cloud object storage, they started looking at it for very specific use cases like just archiving. Um, and, and backup, but then over time they realized the value of unstructured data and they wanted to make a lot more use of it and when they started looking at using that data, mobilizing that data, they realized that they were facing a lot of bill shock um, in, the, in the cloud world because moving data was inefficient and it was expensive and then organizations started building all these disciplines around FinOps as well and then connected to that is they started looking at sustainability, like moving data is very inefficient for them. So how do, make, how do they make the most of that unstructured data in that environment? So egress charges were one of the biggest hurdles in making the most of that data, but connected to that there were other reasons as well because in the, there wasn't much of innovation in that object storage, so um, organizations had to invest a lot more around the data management capabilities as well, but now, we see a lot more innovation, whether it's around cost-optimized object storage or whether it's addition of data services in that environment that's actually really making organizations leverage that unstructured data. And that's what's driving the growth because 15, 16 years ago, that was not the case. Right, right. Much like your cell phones, unstructured data, think about it in terms of video, images, applications like that, that are driving the future of your business and being able to build intelligence into that data and actually be able to locate that data is where the world's headed now. If you hadn't heard about it just about a month ago, we acquired an artificial intelligence company now to make that, that data much more searchable, more predictable to drive your business. So with that, I'm going to go over to Matt and just talk, let's rewind about two and a half years here when we started working with LFC and back then you were on-prem moving to the cloud. Why'd you make the move? Yeah, it's. Um it's something we've kind of wanted to do for quite a long time. And we made the move primarily because having data on premise was, it was unsustainable. It was very hard to scale, it was difficult to manage. And every three to five years, we were kind of looking at doing a big CapEx overhaul and replacing things, syncing things, um, which just became a real kind of heavy burden on us. 
that and the fact that we had to kind of do off-site resilience. Now, we're quite lucky with the fact that we've got facilities, training complexes, but ultimately it still means more things in more places and more people to manage it. And we knew that putting it into the cloud would give us, we'd be able to sleep at night, which is a great thing to start with, but also it means that we can then start to not worry about being restricted to premises and start to kind of like open up our operations. We've got an office down in London, we've got offices in, in the States, we're starting to open offices around the world as well. So ultimately what we need to do is open up our archive, which is not just kind of like sat within one team in Liverpool, to the entire business and start to kind of work with that as a club, and not just a premises based operation. It seemed like at the beginning, security was the risk around moving to the cloud. Yeah, initially that was the kind of the first thing was, where do I store my stuff? How do I make it safe? And then the second thing for us was like, once we put it into, a, into the cloud, then how do we unlock the opportunities that that takes next? Right. So the pandemic, whilst an awful situation, really kind of pushed uh, media industries along heavily to look at remote workflows and how we started to kind of like decentralize our operation from people in an office, nine to five, Monday to Friday. And that was one of the big things that were going to really kicked off for us to think differently about the opportunities that cloud storage would bring to us, purely from a content production point of view. But beyond that, you start to then look at what the additional benefits it brings. So right. when we start to look at the AI aspect, it starts to really open up even more doors. Right. So John, let's talk a little bit about, I'll pull the slide up here for reference point for the audience here. Let's talk about some of the needs of unstructured data. Why, how, how's it, how, how's it getting applied in business now? Yeah, great, great question, Mike. And, and look, you guys have, have set it up perfectly, right? So we've talked about why the transition is happening. Matt is a great case study of that in action. I think Wasabi is in an absolute sweet spot looking at that transition, right? So we're providing cloud object storage, something that's going crazy from you know, 10 to 60 billion, was it your, your numbers? We are 20% of the price of the hyperscalers. But more importantly, we provide complete cost predictability. So you, know, you hear amazing statistics about organizations that are almost spending half of their cloud budget in fees, right? It's not the core storage part, it's the fees part that is inherently unpredictable and kills often the business case for the move to cloud. Wasabi has taken that away. So you only pay for what you store. There's no egress fees, there's no API call fees. So you know, we see that a lot of customers are confident to move maybe at a faster pace because the, the bill shock, right? You know, we've right. all heard of enterprises kind of pouring over their bill from one, one of the hyperscalers. Number one, because they can't understand it. Number two, they can't predict it. Number three, they can't, once they receive the bill, they can't even check it, right? I mean, who knows, right, internally? I don't know, Matt, whether you guys can sit down and say, okay, from our LFC app, you know, how much traffic, how chatty is this application going to be, and how much egress fees are we going to pull in on the back of it, right? I mean, most organizations struggle to do that. I yeah. mean, if that's a... Absolutely, I think one of the big things for us was taking the leap to cloud was, was quite scary because we didn't have the maturity to understand and predict the cost. We could look at how much we were going to store, that was no problem for us, but we didn't know the operational like cost of this. And that was one of the things that held us back for quite some time. So with a kind of a real predictable, you know, we, we're a commercial uh, department. Our job is to kind of drive revenue back into the business to, to invest on a pitch and win trophies. So ultimately we've got to generate revenue uh, and as much as possible and keep our costs low. So that was a big, big deciding factor for us. Yeah, yeah very good. And then I think the other key shift that I see is around the security piece. So as Matt said, the first question was, is this a safe place to put my data? That is kind of changing into actually viewing cloud storage as a part of the organization's cybersecurity posture. So in effect, you know, what Wasabi enables customers to have is an immutable copy in the cloud so that should the worst happen and your organization is subject to a cyber attack taken offline, you've got an immutable copy to then start the process of getting your organization back on track from. So we've gone from a kind of, is this a good place for my data to reside? Is it safe enough to Matt's point? To actually being a proactive part of the security posture of the organization. And we're seeing that kind of whole immutability part as being really key to why customers are choosing Wasabi, but more importantly, why customers are feeling safe to be able to move to the cloud. Right. Actually, that's such an interesting point, right? Because like a couple of years ago, words like immutability would not even yeah. be something that the C-suite discusses, but now, with resilience becoming such a boardroom priority, they are looking at all these capabilities, whether it's air gap, whether it's immutability, to make sure that data is resilient. And to that point about um, cost, I think I ran um, a CIO um, roundtable, especially around cloud, 
and ask them to describe how they are feeling about the cloud in one word. Like three years ago, it was all about excitement and innovation. And the one word that stood out in the last 18 months is nervousness. And that's how nervous they are about the cost in the cloud, right? And, and half of it is, it, it's a shared responsibility. Half of it is also, um, to your point, like what, what do you take um, to the cloud? Are you taking any chatty applications to the cloud? Then it's a, it's a shared responsibility. And one of, one of the CIOs was telling us how you actually almost need a PhD to understand the cloud build. So it, right. there's, there's a lot that goes in there. Yeah. And those are the two use cases that organizations are trying to overcome to make better use of the cloud. And then From, the final thing, sorry, if I can just add one more please. point. I think the, the really exciting thing is the direction all of this is leading. And, the, and the, the question here is, what's the point of storing data if you don't know what you've got? Right? And I know that's the kind of direction that we're going to take this in, but this is the really exciting bit around applying AI and ML to the ingest part of the cloud storage that's right. to be able to make sure that you know what it is that you're storing and that you can retrieve it and that you can leverage and monetize if you've got the opportunity to, to do that. When we started with Saba, we, the idea was to basically collapse or commoditize the cloud storage market. As you're familiar, when you go to any of the hyperscalers, you've got multiple tiers of cloud storage and multiple price points, and then of course you've got multiple egress fees. So our thought was, this isn't that difficult. Make it with, with a, a proprietary technology, we came out with a platform that collapsed it into a single highly performant technology. So the next thing was, how do you make this predictable from a cost standpoint? It's, not, it's one thing to make it affordable from a price standpoint, but as you heard Archana say, predictability of cost is really the big issue here. I'll share with, a quick story with you. I was with this uh, uh, CIO of one of the largest healthcare providers in the United States. And he came in, and the way he started the meeting is he came in and he dropped, no exaggeration, this three pound stack of paper. And he says, do you know what this is? I said, I have no idea. He says, this is my monthly storage bill on AWS. I pay a quarter of a million dollars a month to an outsourced firm to figure out <coughs> how to build this back to each of my hospitals by department. And he looks at me and he says, tell me what your bill would look like. And I asked him how many petabytes he stored. Then I told him, okay, it's $6 a petabyte. He said, okay, what else? I said, that's it. It's, it's that easy. So now, that unlocks the potential, right? Because the whole idea of what we introduced, this concept called the bottomless cloud, is if you can, if you can afford to keep all your data, along comes the wave of artificial intelligence. The more data you keep, the more intelligent your decision making, the more predictable your business outcomes can become. So with that, now I'm gonna go back over to Matt, and let's just talk a little bit about in this particular market, which is actually kind of representative of many of the markets that John deals with every day, there's a starting point which starts with backup, but as you were talking about a little bit earlier, it unlocks all kinds, because data is an affordable commodity now, it unlocks all kinds of other opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think the key thing that, when we look at content storage and we look at Liverpool's media storage as well, it's games, it's interviews, it's press conferences, it's partner activity, it's community stuff, um, and ultimately, it's as good as the metadata that we've got stored against it. And that is down to a human. And ultimately, they might be tagging, but only things they've been told to tag. So it's as good as the information that surrounds it. And even then, there's an amount of local knowledge that's kind of sat against that information. So when somebody moves on, and they said, oh, what was on that shoot three years ago? We just don't know anymore. We've got tapes sat back in the office that I filmed in 2001 that I don't remember what I filmed. So the great thing about having AI across this stuff is now it can kind of tag automatically, it can start to kind of pull out things, and it will look at the basics, it'll do facial recognition, it'll do player tagging, it'll do event-based data. So we can start to now look at our goals, throw-ins, free kicks, penalty spots, you know, 99 minute goal, last ditch winners, that kind of stuff, and that allows an amazing amount of content ideas to come to fruition. Generally, what you would kind of sit there is you'd have an idea and go, okay, how do we do this? And a researcher would go away and spend weeks trying to find that material. Now, all this stuff can come back in an instant, and what it opens for us is creativity. And it, technology doesn't get in the way of it, it starts to really enhance that. And I think the other thing is now also not just kind of being led by people querying that information, it's about the unknown unknowns, like what didn't we know about? How can you start to use AI and machine learning to start to prompt and, and give you ideas and start to feed into what might come next? And at the same time, it's that proactive stuff. You can start to have your regular tasks that are being scheduled for you and done by the time you get there. And we're not talking about replacing people making content, 
we're talking about giving them an amazing amount of tools to get them to be more creative, make more content and engage with even more fans across the, uh, the globe. Yeah, I think that's the coolest thing about all this is finally you're not spending all your time managing your data, right? We're going to talk about automation in a second here, but you're allowed to get back to your core business and how to innovate on the core business instead. So why don't we talk a little bit about what are the other applications of AI on cloud storage and then where does automation come into it all? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of taking a lot of innovation capabilities left almost to the storage environment. So the smarter the storage gets, the easier the other tasks are. So we see, we're beginning to see a lot of organizations looking at automation, especially from a tagging point of view. How can we make tagging, metadata management, all of that automated, and then that can unleash and unlock a lot of opportunities, especially from a compliance perspective as well, right? So a lot of organizations are looking at automation and they're just running scripts to see what are the loopholes they have from a compliance perspective to comply with something new like Dora. And then it just, because AI helps them pull up specific areas where they need help. And then that's targeted activity for them to then invest money in the right place so that they can um, improve their compliance. So there's a lot of value in automation, especially when there is an overwhelming amount of data that organizations have. Doing things manually can take time. And if you want to move at the speed of your creative team, there has to be automation. Right. Yeah. John, you want to jump in on this? You know, I was, I was going to add two things, Mike. <clears throat> the first one is, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, believe it or not, we actually rehearsed this slot. And as we were rehearsing it, Mike said to Matt, are you okay with the other logos? Because there's obviously <laughs> LFC up on this slide. And, and Matt said, as long as Man News not up there, I'm okay. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> so I thought that was a nice one. Um, <laughs> the, the second one is, um, you know, to this theme of tagging, and Archana, I'm going to ask you, I, I love the data point about the Scandinavian right to be forgotten, right? If you wouldn't, I mean, that was just so powerful in terms of the kind of tidal wave of work that's coming that potentially, from a use case perspective, AI and ML can really help. Would yeah, you mind so, sharing yeah, the... So it's about this one organization, a public sector organization we spoke to around GDPR um, in, in Scandinavia, and they said it took them 14 employees and two months to forget one person from all of their environments because all of their processes were so manual, they were not clear workflows, and, the, and, and they were not looking at the data within the backup systems. So to, to make sure that they could, they could live up to the obligation of right to be forgotten, it really took them that, um, that an overwhelming majority of resources to actually get that done. And if you have a lot more subject access requests and right to be forgotten requests, that will no longer do, right? You will just get out of business because all you have to do is just meet these um, regulatory obligations. So it's very important to have that automated. Yeah, yeah. But I think the other exciting thing for me from a vendor perspective is I think we're just at the beginning of understanding the use cases for AI and ML. You know, the, um, the first customer to, to come on board Wasabi's AI ML platform um, after the acquisition of the, of the technology is a global content localization organization actually based here in London. Their use case is providing automatic translate. So essentially, it's, to my simple brain, what they do is when a film is going to be released, they're the organization that is responsible for sending the trailers out, right? So when you go and either you watch on Netflix or you watch in a real cinema, um, you see the trailers for what's coming up. There are very specific regulations in some markets about what can and can't be shown in those trailers. So they're using our AI ML tool to be able to spot the things that shouldn't be shown in that jurisdiction, right? So let's say you're in the Philippines and you're not allowed to show alcohol in a trailer or whatever it is, right? So they, they set up the tagging and say, okay, find me every instance in the trailer of this. That then enables them to go afterwards. And to Matt's point, it's kind of adding value to the manual work that comes after to then be able to edit that out of the trailer. They're also looking for doing automatic translation, automatic subtitling. You know, essentially the whole process of localization is being speeded up and they're taking a lot of the manual work out or they're elevating the manual work to kind of the, the more creative stuff or the harder problems. And we're essentially helping them to get those trailers out, in, in some cases halving the time that it took to be able to localize a, a trailer that they're working on. So as I say, it's something I'd never thought, sorry, it's something I'd never thought of, and it's a really, and that's when it gets exciting, right? You sit down with customers, understand what their pain points are, and potentially, you know, AI, ML can, can play a role. 
I think there's a, a lot of hype around AI these days, obviously. Um, it really comes down to what real world use, use case applications are. Matt, for a second, I'm just going to throw a slide up here. Just kind of walk through the audience. I know you have four different teams, basically a game every other day, 365 days a year, right? So talk about what this is and how this impacts people. Yeah, so, so as, as Mike mentioned, what people might not realize, we cover the men's game, the women's game, under 21s, under 18s. So that is literally about 180 games a year, which we're talking averaging nearly two, two games every day, a game every other day. So it's an insane amount of content that comes through the door. And we can't always kind of like realize that people can kind of do this stuff. We can't scale in the way that we want to scale. Um, Back, back to the point before about kind of even taking that to a wider audience. We currently do eight languages across our entire YouTube channel right now, but we have to do that in a way that kind of somebody transcribes it, then it goes out to an agency, then it comes back again. Then we do that for another language, another language. And what we're seeing here now with AI is it, it just creates everything to be faster. Everything's much quicker. And the great thing about it being from the cloud is it's centralized. So we don't have to send things off and we don't have to worry about security. We don't have to worry about our assets disappearing around somewhere, ending up being pirated on, um, on YouTube or another social media website. So we've got the control aspect. Well, then we've also got the kind of centralized information aspect. So we're still the one source of the truth that kind of comes back to us. And that allows us to kind of scale really smartly and not just put a person onto every single thing that we do, because that's just not how we could work. We'd fall over completely overnight. We'd have to have a thousand people in my team doing what we really want to do. So what you're seeing here is players being tagged, partner logos being tagged. You've then got the potential to kind of start to pick up, you know, the crowd shots. You know, if you've got somebody who, who might, who shouldn't be in your stadium, you've got the potential to kind of see those kind of things. You could have a flare in the picture. Now, we're not supposed to show flares on the kind of content that we show. So we could start to remove that from our edits. And again, we, we could see something that we, the, the human element of the creative process doesn't pick up. Whereas AI and ML will start to kind of pick those up for us. So this just strengthens us every single time. All right, so the lights are off, so that means it's officially time to go to questions. Yes, please. Is that accurate? Yep. All right. We've got a, a roving microphone. There's one there. Casey? And by the way, um, you're in West Ham territory here, and as a <laughs> Hammers supporter, I have to say, the London Stadium isn't that far from here. <laughs> Hi, it was, it was a question for Matt, as someone that spent many, many hours in the queue for Liverpool tickets, and uh, three hours to board, I didn't get a ticket experience. I just wonder if there's any plans to use AI or machine learning to improve that fan ticketing experience at all? It's a really interesting question. Ticketing's not my area, um, but I know um, literally this, this week we're starting to kind of like put an internal AI working group at the football club across all the various things. Um, I know the guy who runs a ticketing platform um, and he's really interested in kind of what technology can do. So we're never, we never rest on our laurels, we never stop. And we're always looking to see what we can use to make our lives easier, but also make it better for a fan. I, I would also add, um, if you buy a petabyte of storage, I'll sort you out with some tickets. <laughs> <laughs> that you're guaranteed to get into the game. Uh, also, if you're a Liverpool fan, just Phil Thompson. Anybody know who Phil Thompson is, the Liverpool legend? He is in our booth right now. We're okay. at the very front of the show. So very please good. feel free to stop by, get a photo, get an autograph with him afterwards. Another question. Anything else? Oh, one more. Uh, as another Anfield regular, um, but we won't do that. I did like the 99th minute joke you did before, though. Um, why did you choose Wasabi as your partner? Um, so, traditionally, to start with, it was very much based around predictability. We knew we had to go cloud, right? It was inevitable. But for us, it was about predictability of cost and affordability as well. Egress charges scared me to death, you know, because we are constantly kind of digging up archive, looking at this game, looking at that game. And that, for me, was something we couldn't predict. So we needed predictable costs, we needed reliable storage, and we needed to get into the cloud in a way that was, you know, the right step for us. Just for the record, we didn't plant that question, okay? Uh, and the last time we held one of these panels, we couldn't get anybody to ask a question. And if anybody recognize, recognizes the name David James, the goalie, yeah. he was in the audience. He's the first one to come out with a technical question. It was pretty cool. Okay, question over there. Did you want to make a point? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, might be a bit of a controversial question, this one, so feel free to duck it if you wish. But um, I'm just learning about, particularly in regard to the hyperscalers and the sort of competitions and markets authority in the UK and the European Union looking at their dominance and, and all of the issues, the practical issues that you guys have discussed on the panel today. 
is there is there do you feel an over dependence in business on hyperscalers and is regulation the answer or will it just kind of will the market kind of find its way i'd just be interested to get your take on that question and whether you think regulation is necessary and how the market is structured from your point of view well you know wasabi's view but we'll let the real expert talk of course there's an over dependence on that. I don't know if it helps Go but it's got to be yeah. a quick answer yeah sure no i think a lot of organizations have this desire to be multi-cloud for that very reason and now you have regulators taking charge as well so you have the digital operational resilience act that's forcing organizations to really look at their third-party ICD suppliers and to make sure they are building mechanisms around resilience and uh, reducing that vendor locking. So I think that that is a way to overcome those kind of challenges. But yes, we are. Um, there is merit for organizations to actually go down the route of an anchor cloud because and because of limited skills, they can innovate faster. Mm -hmm. But then it's always yeah. a balance that an organization needs to strike depending on their appetite for risk. Um, Mike, go ahead. Stop me if I've already said this. But if I haven't, did I say that we're 20% of the list price of AWS <laughs> and we have zero egress fees? You might have mentioned that. <laughs> I, uh, the, I market would, will, the market I will just, find us. Just add to Archana's comments, uh, just look at the market. Over the last 30 days alone, two of the hyperscales have come out and said, we'll, we'll remove your egress fees if you want to move your data out. Yeah. So the, the hyperscales are starting to hear, feel the pressure of the consumer, yeah. right? Now, the, the, the funny thing about that is if you look underneath the covers, you're not moving your data outside there, but they're covering their you know what by making sure that the world's hearing that statement. But there is a lot of pressure now to go into multi-cloud environments. We all set? I'm afraid we've run out of time. Okay. Thank, right. you. Thank you so much for your time, Thanks folks. Very much. Appreciate it. Thanks.